by the way, it's a great uh, opportunity. Conversations I'd be having with if I'm in your shoes with my manufacturer it wouldn't be about growth bonus or anything like that. It would be about how do I get smarter? How do you aggregate all the things that you know and how do you make me smarter in order to be more competitive in the marketplace? Those are the things you ought to be talking to your manufacturer about, not what your percentage bonus is going to be or whether or not you're going to get to go to anything. So the, these things are important. Uh, and I think that they're, you know, they're vital for, for the, the success of, of your business in the future. So here's um, Lowell Brandon. And, um, you know, so young workers are coming out. Um, and, and this is an important piece of the discussion that you're having with customers. And it's going to become more and more uh, important. Uh, there are offices uh, now that are 100% wireless. Uh, I know because I've been working one, and, and it's almost 100%. We actually do have landlines in our right. We do have we do have landline uh, telephones still in our offices, but in our right, no one ever calls us. Um, it's all all our mobile phones, but our you know keyboards are wireless, our monitors are wireless. We print in any location throughout the facility from any device at any time. It's just the way it is. Uh, we have accounts that are doing the same. And the ability to sell that solution, the ability to sell to that environment, takes a little bit of a different, a different skill set. Next, shift inside. So um, I, I said that this is going to be um, maybe a little bit more, not controversial, but you may, you may disagree more strongly with me on this than, than in, other, uh, in other subjects. Um, we're moving aggressively inside. Uh, we've gone in last year from uh, two inside salespeople to 20. They now comprise um, close to 20%, 18% of my sales force. I would expect over the uh, next few years it will approach 50. Won't we'll ever be 100. I still need a, I still need a sales rep in front of the customer. No, no doubt about it. But the way customers are buying has changed so dramatically. Um, hi, my name is Todd. You want to buy a copier? It just doesn't work, right? So, used to. Um, it, it, the, the, the buying process has changed dramatically. So, what happens now, it depends on the size of the organization uh, that you're calling on, but the IT buyer, is buying the technology that you're selling. They'll get you know, three phone calls from vendors, and when they get three phone calls on the same subject, and it's a subject with which they're not familiar, let's call it managed print services, uh, they don't call those three people back. Yeah. It's not what they do. I, I talked to them at round tables. That's not what they do. They're not interested in the people who call them. What they will do is they'll go to IDC or they'll go to Parker and they'll learn about the subject. And then they'll look at the magic quadrant, and they'll start to evaluate uh, vendors, uh, and then they'll go to those vendors' websites. And they'll pick three or four from the websites, and they'll fill out information cards, and they'll find out what happens. And they'll get contacted by those companies, um, and they will engage in a conversation about the subject that they're now newly interested in. Uh, and that's what initiates uh, the process. So people on the street trying to generate uh, activity and generate prospects. If you've got sales reps who say, I just can't get an appointment, but don't fire them. Uh, it's, it's so hard. It is so hard. And it's, I mean, it was harder 10 years ago than it was 20 years ago. It's a lot harder today than it was just two or three years ago. That's not going to get any better. So the buying process has changed dramatically. It's more cost effective inside. Um, you know, one of the examples you know, I might ask you to, to, to consider is, you know, take a sales rep uh, who's successful in your organization, find out how many face-to-face -face calls they really make relative to the potential that they're doing a lot of their job over the phone and, and on email. They're doing a lot of their job today from a home office or from your office um, on email and through the phone. So in, ostensibly making them an inside salesperson, 
Well, when you can hire inside salespeople a lot more efficiently, a lot more, and they're more effective, right? You've got to have a strong website, um, and you've got to align yourself with your manufacturer uh, on your website. You've got to get leads because they're not coming to your website, but they will, once they've started to evaluate you, they will. The, the, and I think in very little. So, uh, there is not, the website's not necessarily going to be demand generation for you, but it is going to be credibility. It's going to be the price tag that you're going to need to pay uh, in order to get consideration um, moving forward. You have to create demand. Um, so, you know, we're creating demand through uh, advertising. We create demand through participation in trade shows. You uh, create demand, very little with outbound telemarketing, but a little bit, a little bit of direct mail. You've got to figure out the path uh, that your sales force um, uh, cherishes the most relative to getting uh, leads and, and interest uh, into in their hands. Social media and social selling. Um, you're going to hear and read more about this in the years to come than you really want to. Everybody's favorite is LinkedIn. All your sales force ought to be on LinkedIn. Um, we're now calling on, I called on the chief technology officer of Sears a couple months ago. Uh, I went to give her my business card, and she said, I don't do business cards. I'll just, just reach out to me on LinkedIn. So sponsor it, then train your sales force with some good advice from counsel, by the way, on, on what you can and can't do on LinkedIn. Um, but we are taking the stance that um, we, we, need, we need our sales to rest actively on LinkedIn. Um, there is this whole um, opportunity of social selling. The whole opportunity of social selling is, you know, I see Ed McLaughlin, how's it going? I understand you're in a new job in Philadelphia. By the way, do you know so-and-so over there? I can get you into that account, and I build up social chits, right? And then I spend them. Because at some point, I can go to Ed's LinkedIn page and I can say, hey, you know somebody over at ABC. Would you mind getting in front of that decision maker? This is happening today. This is happening throughout you know, industry. And social selling uh, in LinkedIn or other vehicles, we will see if LinkedIn is the vehicle that wins in the future, um, is uh, a thing of, uh, I think, a, a major selling opportunity. You've got to obviously um, take all this information that you have. You've got to really be comfortable with your CRM system because information is just so vital, particularly if you build an engine of inside sales and people who are nurturing accounts and a way of keeping in touch with people. If you have the right CRM system, we use Salesforce.com. I'm not advertising for them, just uh, that's, that's who we use. But there needs to be an ongoing relationship through customer relationship management uh, that you're all comfortable with. Um, you know, I grew up, uh, you know, in the days of ACT and other things that we've that we utilized, but um, there, there are lots of vehicles for you to be able to do that. Key here is uh, alignment with your manufacturer. So that decision maker isn't going to your website, they're going to the manufacturer's website. Uh, and they're in your geography. And what they do with that information is of great importance to you. And if I were in meetings with my manufacturer, those, again, those would be the types of things, fundamental things that I would be talking to them about. What are you doing with those leads? How, how can I share on those? What do I need to do uh, in order to be able to have uh, an opportunity to get at that business? Because more and more of future demand generation is going to come through those, through those relationships. The other one is, I, if you go back to my slide on being trendy, I think manufacturers have a great responsibility to help the dealer channel with these issues as well. Um, uh, we, we have an outside uh, consultant that we use. I'm going to tell you who it is. It's called Sales Benchmark Index. Sales Benchmark Index um, counsels us. I hired them because when, when I'm going from only two inside salespeople to 
20, and we'll probably go to 30 and 40 and keep going. Um, I want to make sure we're doing it right. And so we brought those folks in, and they've uh, an exhaustive study of what it is we're doing and how we need to improve to become more effective. What I'm doing now is we're going to put those guys in a WebEx and, and open it up to the DTA channel so they can give a one or two hour WebEx on what this subject is all about. And I think that's my responsibility to the dealer community. That if these, if we believe that these are the things that are going to be changing in the world, uh, you need to reach out and, and get out there uh, and help your dealers to, uh, to, to grow their business. Go inside. Coming down the home stretch. Uh, here, power disruption. So, um, uh, our, our friends from uh, OP before talked about uh, this trend. We, we agree. Uh, we see the, the, the business going from uh, A4 to A3. It's a dilemma. It's a conundrum. I get it. It's hard. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit about it. Just got a few slides. So, uh, we talked about all the changes that are going on in the marketplace other competitors getting into the space. Um, and for years, this was your business. So if you had an account that had multiple floors, let's just say an enterprise, you know, a, a, a rather large you know, account for you, this is what you did, and this is what everybody in the industry did. They put A3 color MFP devices connected in every room. Okay. Makes sense. Why? Well, because that's what they need. Customer needs color, uh, although color is now 17% of the volume, 18% of the volume in the US, so uh, people need color. So they need to bring color, it's gotta be color. Um, they put in 11 by 17, they put in A3. Now, uh, A4, A4 is, on MFP devices, is 2% of the volume in the US. I'm sorry, A3 is 11 by 17 is 2%. But it doesn't matter. Occasionally, someone's going to need it, and they can only print it in the work group. So I'm going to put 11 by 17 A3 so you can print it in the work group. And we built our business this way. And all your competitors have built the business this way. This is the typical enterprise hardware portfolio of a couple of years ago, and it's changing swiftly. And it's going to change, I think, uh, dramatically. And the question for you is, what are you going to do about it? How, how are you going to do it? And my position to you is you've got to drive it. You've got to drive the construction. So what happened? Well, we all learned about um, utilizing the, um, the MFP as an on-ramp for document distribution. We all learned about e-copy. That's what kind of got us into the software business, right? That whole document distribution world. And that remains, right? So kind of the whole capture um, uh, part of the business remains. Device management, um, kind of managing the devices on the network, you know, figuring out volumes per device, that will work. On the far right-hand side, um, you know, document management. Some of you have gotten really good at that. It's a little bit more complex, um, but it makes sense. It's, it's tangential, probably, to the sale. But it's a good revenue uh, producer for a lot of people who provide the services around document management. I think the game changer is output management. I think uh, companies like Ferros and Equitrack and Papercut and others in the manufacturers' uh, offerings that they have uh, are best. This is the game changer. And it's the game changer for some of, some of the features associated with output management, not necessarily all of them. Um, you know, job routing or job ticketing into the CRD are all really great specific functions, but I think fundamentally the ability to take your employee badge or a security number and have all the friends be able to go to any location throughout an organization and be able to scan your employee badge and look at your print queue and decide at that point what it is you want to print or what it is you don't want to print and then have some sort of management mechanism so that you can, or management then can know what it is that you're all printing by a person as opposed to a device is the game changer. And it's the game changer because you don't need A3 color MFP, copier based MFP technology in every, in every work group anymore. Because now you're not just printing into the work group, you're printing wherever you print in the enterprise. And uh, if you have a lead by 17 document you need to print, you can damn well go down the hall and you can print it with one uh, A3 device. 
device that's outfitted down the hall. Um, the enterprise integration, next big world, by the way, of software, I didn't finish that. How we integrate some of the uh, document management piece into the ERP system is important. So this is the office of the future. Um, and it's what's happening today. I should even say it's the office of the future. This is what's happening today. So people are now configuring and saying, okay, let, let me put, and in, in many cases, just if, you know, A4 black and white uh, for people to use. If they need color, they can walk to the end of the hall. If they need 11 by 17, they can walk to the end of the hall. And the corresponding reduction in hardware is considerable. And the lowering of the cost per page associated with A4, the trend, is what's making the total cost of ownership more in line or significantly less than the current configuration. And you know, but for the fact that it's probably confidential information, I could list a dozen major accounts that have done this in the last couple of years. This is a uh, this is a, a, a trend. This is what's going to happen. So the question for you is now: What am I going to do about it? Uh, because I built my business and my revenue, and I, I think uh, my friend Bill, he said, well, you, you, you can resist this, right? Because I've got these $12,000 devices that I've been selling. My customer is going to buy them again. Why would I want to sell them $3,500 or $3,000? I don't get it. Why would I want to do that? So I just have two things for you. Number, number one is don't, if you don't want it. If you think your customer is well served by you selling them color A3 devices in the workgroup. God bless you. Keep it up. But keep it up knowing full well somebody's in there with a proposal trying to disrupt you. You gotta have a pitch as to why it's important to have color in 11 by 17 in every workgroup. But if I were in your shoes and I thought I could, you know, keep it. And if the sales rep is basically the one you're paying to make that proposal, um, that's fine. Go ahead and keep it. But when I say power disruption, you ought to go at the competitive installations that are similarly configured with an aggressive, aggressive proposal on how you can save that customer money through a combination of a better array of hardware along with output management software that drives a better configuration for there are some manufacturers out there that are doing it very successfully today, but in the local market, again, with an account that's big enough, um, it is uh, an opportunity for you to power that disruption. The, um, I don't want to speak to any particular competitors, but there are probably three or four competitors out there who don't want this to happen. And they're taking the stance that we're going to hang on to that color A3 for as long as we can. So the competitive opportunity for you to disrupt is great. Size matters. This is my last, uh, my last slide. And I think I'm OK. I'm um, last slide before I give you my little overview of uh, um, I, I just think it's almost like I say it here, it's a split personality. You're not telling you, you gotta be local, you gotta be small, it's great, you know, go to the chamber of commerce and do all that stuff. But the fact is, you're competing with the manufacturers that are big and they provide services and it's tough and you've got to be able to show your customers that you're big enough in order to be able to, to support them. Everybody's got a different view of this and every geography is different, but there's a certain threshold of size below which it's going to be tough to be a dealer five years from now. It's just going to be tough. And uh, I've heard that the number $5 million kicked around. I think $5 million is probably fine for some locations, but I think you know, $10 million in major metropolitan areas isn't going to be big enough. But there's got to be size so that you can amortize the expense that you've made and the investment that you've made in headquarters and in support and all these other things I'm talking in order to be able to amortize that over a, 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 a bigger portfolio size. So what does that mean for you? It means merging and acquisition. It means making sure that you've gotten yourself to a size um, that you think is sustainable. If you've got you know, one family who's living on your business, 
favor of that. So that's my view on that. So um, it's going to be great. Um, I, I think you're all great. Right. I'm a huge BTA fan. Uh, I hope um, you appreciate my point of view and uh, the advice that uh, I gave you today. And we probably don't have time for questions and answers before I move into uh, my discussion, but maybe afterwards uh, I'll hang out a little bit during uh, you know, the reception. I'd be happy to answer uh, any questions that you might have. But if I may, hold on just for a minute. I want to talk a little bit about my company. So I've been here for a year and a half. It's hilarious to work with Samsung. Uh, it is a, um, it's fast growing. We're $188 billion. Uh, we grew $42 billion last year. Uh, it's, it's, it's a culture of discovery. It's a culture of how do you make technology work? How do you help customers? The themes we talk about are improving student learning and improving patient care. It's not a device-oriented type of approach. And as a result, it's just a, a thoroughly enjoyed uh, my time and a half there. I look forward to anything more. Um, we're big. We spent um, uh, about $11 billion last year in R&D. We're the second largest patent holder um, in, in the US now for a number of years. We're the ninth most valuable uh, brand in the world. Um, as a, so this is my part of the business. We're organized in the U.S. Uh, with three different businesses. The phone business is run out of Dallas. So they basically sell phones to four companies, AT&T and Verizon and T-Mobile. That's the business in Dallas. Uh, we're based in Richfield Park, New Jersey. We have a consumer business. Uh, a colleague of mine runs that, and I run the enterprise business, which is one of, of these businesses. I'll start over on the right-hand side. Uh, we're in the health and medical business. We make ultrasound and medical devices uh, for folks on women's health. Uh, we're in the set-top box business. We sell cable, cable boxes to the pay TV providers around the country. Uh, I'm in the uh, hospitality TV. Anything that's in-room TVs, um, so it's uh, hospitals, uh, cruise ships, nursing homes, um, those are the customer base for our hospitality TV and it's made where you have to kind of connect to content providers who um, uh, you can turn on your TV and it says, hey, welcome to the, you know, the, the fitness centers on the fourth floor, et cetera. So those are three standalone businesses. And then we've got these other businesses that are uh, in what we call IT systems. We're in the memory business, a large commercial display, desktop monitor, mobile computing, which is we sell laptops, we sell tablets, uh, and then printer and copier. And uh, each of these businesses, thankfully, are growing uh, substantially. So we're, uh, this business, uh, I want to share with you, this business here in total grew 87% year over year in the first half. So we're, we're doing some we're doing some fun things, which has been, been great. So uh, we're focused on vertical. Our key verticals are education, um, hospitality, finance, retail, and, and healthcare. Uh, we're serious about them. What we're really serious about is how these devices work together. So if you look at education, it's how does the tablet work with an electronic whiteboard with mobile print in the office uh, in, in an interoperable wireless way to improve um, student learning. That's what we do. In the, in the hospital, is how do those devices work together to improve patient care. So that's what we're doing. Now, of course, in the meantime, we're selling a lot of devices. Um, and, and clearly, uh, you know, printers and copiers, in most cases, are more standalone decisions, although they're starting to transition over. So we're, we're focused on not only how do we have our products be working in an interoperable way, but how do we best you know, move product into the market by product by product. So um, why, why us? Well, we're um, a big brand, a big company. We're growing um, uh, the technology. So, you know, Mike said that he had experience with us uh, from years ago. We're really serious about the print copy space. Uh, and we're investing heavily in this business. And we have very, very high expectations of where we're going to end up. Uh, and we are taking the measures necessary uh, in order to get there. So we are aggressively pursuing the BTA channel, um, and we are building it out and very encouraged by the number of new dealers who have come, come on in the last year. Very 
are encouraged by the growth of, of this business. Um, and we have some new technologies um, that help us over the architecture of the user interface. The engine technology is good. We, we, we live in a world at Samsung where most of my products are more expensive than average. That's not the case with the, with the printer and copy line. We actually have a significant cost uh, advantage and as a result, uh, a price advantage. And so people are taking our product and they're taking it into markets and into accounts that they couldn't penetrate before. And they're bringing it into portfolios of products, mixing it in on the low end in order to make the overall solution uh, more successful for the dealerships. Um, partnership. Um, we don't compete with um, our dealers, so we have no interest. It's not in our DNA. Um, we just are not a company um, that is focused on going directly to the end market. We respect um, the channel partners uh, that we have. And I think, and I've got some colleagues here today, uh, Tesco and uh, Tom Pryor and, and uh, Dan Christie with me today. We're really building a great team of support. Um, and uh, we think we're doing all the right things in supporting the BTA uh, channel. And the topics that I discussed earlier today, I'm really serious about getting our dealers really smart on those topics. And uh, we, we take uh, a big responsibility as the manufacturer, as the vendor in this, in order to bring those, uh, uh, those dealers up to speed on each of those topics. And we have success. So um, we have a lot of accounts. Um, where we've been selling mobile computing and where we've been selling uh, monitors over the years and we're just uh, most recently uh, getting very active in bringing hard copy or print copy uh, business in front of those accounts. Um, we do have uh, an end market sales force that's pretty extensive, uh, but we in all cases uh, work with our, our channel partners. But there are a lot of these accounts, they look at us as a, if we're the sales people. And we've got relationships at very, very high levels uh, in a lot of those accounts. So for these reasons, uh, if you're looking for a, uh, an additional um, partner or a vendor, um, we, we are building this out on a, a little bit of a limited basis when I say partnership. Um, we don't envision a world where there's going to be three, four, five, six Samsung dealers in marketplaces. Uh, we're looking to pick the right channel partner. Uh, one that shares our vision for the future uh, and somebody who's willing to do the things that we're looking uh, for them to do in order to be able to grow. Um, and again, yeah, I've been very encouraged by uh, the receptivity that we've had thus far. So um, with that, you've been a very kind audience. I'm finishing bang on, on time, I think. Uh, and I just want to thank you for your, um, your participation today and for your attention. Thank you very much.